Contested Bones, Part 17. Uh, we've been going through the book Contested Bones by Christopher Roop and John Sanford. Um, there's more information on the book at the website. Uh, the cover looks like that. Uh, Christopher Roop there is on the left and uh, John Sanford on the right. And they've cooperated in a book and the prologue explains why. John Sanford believed in evolution until about the age of 50, when he realized the impotence of evolution and the impact of what he calls genetic entropy. Um, you might think of it as devolution. And then had cognitive dissonance with his conclusions and all the fossil evidence of man evolving from apes. And so he and one of his protégés, Chris Rupp, set out to investigate. And chapter one gives you introductory things, the advancing apes icon, the evolutionary story, scientific method, and taxonomic <coughs> principles. Chapter two outlines the traditional picture, which following Darwin's expectations is straight line evolution. The field is now widely acknowledged to be more bush-like and, and we're going to run into quotations saying that next week. And some state that the ascent of man cannot be traced. These are evolutionists and believe in long ages. And yet they still say, you, we don't know if there's any of those uh, that are ancestors of us. Almost all the fossils are contested. Uh, then he goes through the evidence for Neanderthals and finds that Neanderthals are in fact human. The evidence from Homo erectus says Homo erectus is human. Same way with uh, Homo floresiensis or the hobbit. Australopithecus afarensis is an ape, and the human-like parts are the parts that are not there. Uh, Ardipithecus rambidus is an ape, and the human parts, again, are the parts that are not there, although they're different parts. So how you get from Ardipithecus rambidus to Australopithecus afarensis is kind of a question. Uh, Homo habilis is, in fact, a mixture of ape and human. Uh, they give reasons for the believing that. The same is true for Australopithecus sediba. And Homo naledi is, according to their uh, reckoning, fully human, although I understand there are some that are disputing that now in the creationist community. But uh, they point out that, uh, that most, uh, most evolutionary anthropologists will agree now because of the dating. Uh, modern, in chapter 11 they point out that modern humans lived alongside of apes and then with the new evidence back to 5.7 million years by conventional dating. Which means that you actually have two trees. And chapter 12 argues that conventional dating is flawed. Potassium argon and argon dating argon-argon dating have trouble identifying recent lava and the same is true for uranium-thorium dating and carbon-14 dating actually argues for a long, young age of life on Earth, a topic somewhat familiar to the Sava school, even when dating methods agree. If they don't make sense, we can always change them. In chapter 13 we've been going through genetic evidence and the first part of it is validation of the ape to man story. Uh, well, this is actually the introduction. The first part of it is does genetic evidence prove what the fossil record has failed to show and states that there are four profound genetic problems with ape to man evolution. This is the anti-argument. And just my paraphrase here, the changes are needed are more complex than usually thought. The needed mutations are rarer than usually thought and the needed mutations are more likely to get lost than not by genetic drift. And the combination of that is you can't find the mutations. And what's worse is in the meantime, 
deleterious mutations are piling up because there are too many of them and selection is often too weak to get rid of them. In fact, most of the time is too weak to get rid of them. And that means that you're slowly going downhill and you're climbing at such infinitesimal steps that you'll never make it up. Refuting genetic evidence claimed to be proved man, uh, a man evolution, that's the one we went over last week. The argument from similarity is usually overstated. And this is just a kind of summary. The arguments from the beta globin pseudogene, the gulo gene, and repeated elements have to assume that these elements are non-functional. And after ENCODE, this assumption is shaky to say the least. So we come to the chromosome 2 fusion model. Perhaps the most famous genetic argument for ape human common ancestry, also used in the Kitzmiller versus Dover trial, is the claim that human chromosome 2 arose by the fusion of two chromosomes in the hypothetical chimp human common ancestor. Because it's either that or it got split apart, you have your choice. I mean, if you've got common ancestry, you have to have. And one way or another, those chromosomes are different, so something happened, and fusing is, is kind of almost forced on you. The fusing eight chromosomes, previously called chromosome 12 and 13, because they, of their length, now called chromosome 2A and 2B, because of their evolutionary supposed history, are claimed to have merged to create human chromosome 2. This supposedly explains why chimps have 48 chromosomes and humans have 46. Technically, this would not be a shared mistake, but would be a unilateral mistake, with the original two chromosomes still being found in apes unchanged, while hum human chromosome 2 would be a sense a fossil of an ancient mistake, um, which would make humans less advanced than apes, interestingly enough. Um, the claimed fusion was originally based simply upon similarity. The two simp chromosomes are very similar genetically to the two halves of human chromosome 2. However, this was not strong evidence because similarity does not prove common descent. However, in 1991, it was claimed that we can actually see the exact place in human chromosome 2 where the chromosome fusion occurred. There is a very short sequence found within chromosome 2 that is claimed to be the actual fossilized fusion site. And we're going to visit reference 58 in a little bit. Well, towards the end, anyway. This very short DNA sequence is said to be perfect, to perfectly match what would be expected if the hypothetical fusion actually happened, assuming the original chimp chromosome tips, or telomeres, fused end to end. We will refer to this short DNA sequence within human chromosome 2 as the reputed fusion sequence, or RFS. The reputed fusion sequence has been used as a proof of human evolution in textbooks over the last two decades. Remarkably, in the last several years, this famous icon of human evolution has become hotly contested. Why contested? Well, because it isn't really very good, as we'll see. But letting go of it means now you can't explain why humans have one chromosome less than apes and chimps. The evidence for a chromosome 2 fusion now appears to be collapsing. And we're going to look at that reference too. Briefly, we describe the pros and cons of 10 aspects of the fusion hypothesis. A. Chromosome fusions do happen in nature, and the resulting fused chromosome can be transmitted to the next generation. However, such fusions are generally very deleterious. They reduce fertility and disrupt chromosome architecture. And so normally there is selection against such events. Fusions are a manifestation of genetic entropy. While it is feasible there was a chromosome 2 fusion, there is no reason to assume that the fusion happened in millions, millions of years ago or that it happened in a pre-human population. The fusion could just as well have happened in the early human population. So even if there had been a fusion of two cr smaller chromosomes leading to our hu current human chromosome 2, 
This would not be compelling evidence of ape to man evolution. It could be simply human evolution. I'm going to interject a couple of comments here. This is an example of claiming more than is warranted. The story of the fusion of, human, of chromosome 2 is something desperately needed by the theory of common descent. Because like I say, otherwise you have to break it apart. Um, which is really unimportant to any theory of separate creation. The only advantage is that one's th theory's predictions have supposedly been vindicated. Evolutionary theory said it should be there, it's there, see? We are doing good science. It would be the same in the reverse direction as if creationists used the Yellowstone Fossil Forest reevaluation as a proof of a creationist time scale. I think it's nice to have, but it's not proof by any means. It is nice to have predictive power in your theory, but it is not proof that the other theory is wrong. And so they're actually going for a goal, not a win. Okay, part B, most germline fusions, in, in, that is fusions that are passed on to the next generation, do not actually arise as end-to-end -end fusions, but instead arise due to mistakes in the crossing over process. Chromosome fusions arrive arise within cancer cells end to end, but these are not transmitted to the next generation. Crossover fusions result in the deletion of the ends of each fus fusing chromosome. This means that the special telomere sequence at the ends of both chromosomes would be deleted, and any genes in the crossover region would also be deleted. <coughs> so there would not be any trace of a sequence such as the RFS no associated subtelomeric sequences, and there would be no trace of internal telomeric sequences. In other words, you would never know where it went, except for maybe you'd see the chromosome 2 fit together with chromosome 2b, except for little tiny pieces, and that's obviously where the crossover happened. That's what you would expect. On the other hand, if there really were an end-to-end -end fusion, then both of the telomeres would be preserved, each one having two th 3,000 copies of the telomeric hexameter or hexamer repeated. We're going to look at that at the very end. This would result in a very large and easily recognized invert repeat about 24,000 to 36,000 bases long, if it really fused that way. But this is not what is seen. Remember 2,000, 3,000 bases, what was it again? 24,000 bases long. What we actually see is a short sequence, 798 bases, less than 1,000, containing just a few dozen imperfect repeats. It might be argued that since healthy telomeres help prevent end-to-end -end fusions, maybe both of the two fusing chromosome tips were severely degraded with both telomeres eroded to near extinction and then they finally combined. This is feasible, but a very weak argument. It's not what you'd expect. It seems unlikely that both of the fusing chromosomes were degraded to exactly the same point, yielding a minimized and semi-symmetrical fusion site. You're gonna see exactly how symmetrical when we get done. The f reduced size of chromosome two compared to the two putative fusing chromosomes also strongly suggests that if there was a fusion, it involved deletion of both chromosome ends as is observed in illegitimate crossing over events. The RFS is not only much smaller than would be expected, it is too divergent from the actual known telomeric repeat pattern, and we're gonna see that too. It's only 70% identity. The mere fact that this short sequence has some limited homology to um, telomeric DNA carries little weight because there are many similar telomere-like sequences found throughout the human genome. With all such sequen while all such sequences are weakly homologous to short tele uh, telomeric fragments, these intrachromosomal telomere-like motifs do not show any evidence of being ancient fusion sites. There's a lot of these things 
that are kind of like this, that as far as we know weren't fusion sites. Uh, yes, uh, can we pass the mic back? Uh, looks like you're gonna have to come down a little bit. Yes. Um, so I feel like I, I don't know, maybe missed something or don't understand something, so I'm, I'm sort of knocked off track and not, not following. Can you explain, um, is it like if you have fusion of two chromosomes that they sort of align uh, where there's base pairs that sort of line up with each other and then they cross at that point? Um, well, they're obviously crossing while malaligning, shall we say. While aligning very badly. What, what, what's the reason why, why we would expect an um, inverted sequence? Um, well, the inverted sequence could happen if you have telomeres that are right, uh, they, they fuse, leaving a few pieces of telomere here and a few pieces of telomere here. Or actually, you'd expect many, certainly when cancer cells do it, it's many. Um, but the idea is that they fuse and then, uh, and then you have the telomere sequence coming out of one and then going into the other one. So that's why they, they, do, uh, they do an inversion halfway through. And I think it'll be a lot more clear when I show you the original article and, uh, and the sequence that they have. So um, it, it's, the key thing is the inverted telomere sequence, which simply means that telomeres are coming in um, from one end. side and from the other. Okay. Yeah. Now, the sequences that m flank the RFS should match up with sequences near the ends of the corresponding chimp chromosomes. If you're doing this, you don't just have the telomeres themselves, you have what they call subtelomeric stuff that should be next to them, right? Unfortunately, we cannot easily test this because the ends of the two corresponding chimp chromosomes have not yet been fully sequenced. So we're doing this partly in the dark. However, the actual region that contains the RFS, which is assumed to be derived from two ape chromosomes, now appears to be DNA that is uniquely human and is absent in all ape genomes. So the stuff that's next to it is brand new stuff. And uh, not to steal the, their thunder too much, but in one of the next letters, we're gonna find out that it's functional. The uh, UCSC genome browser shows that all the great ape genomes fail to align with either the RFS or the flanking 3,000 plus base pairs. So at this point, nothing matches that. This is a very serious problem for the fusion hypothesis. <coughs> Likewise, there should be nearly perfect homology uh, between the much larger 200,000 base pair region that flanks the fusion site of human chromosome two and the corresponding regions of the two cr chimp chromosomes that are thought to have fused. But this is not what is seen. The entire region of human chromosome two does not appear to have homology with any part of the two chimp chromosomes that are thought to have fused. Instead, this very sizable region within human chromosome two only aligns with various other chromosomes of the chimp genome, such as chromosome nine and chromosome 12, et cetera. So there's, you know, it looks like somebody has mixed and put stuff in between there. And the closest anal analogy we have is to uh, other, uh, other chimp chromosomes, not to chromosome two. So apparently, if you're trying to envision this, you're picking off a piece from another chromosome and another chromosome, putting them in, and then you're fusing chromosome 2A and 2B. Uh, yes, Jack. Uh, I hope my question's relevant to where you are, but um, <clears throat> how similar, or has this not been done, are the sequences within 23 versus 24 chromosomes to each other? In other words, can you identify chromosomes in human 
that are more similar to ape. In other words, could you match chromosome to chromosome for all 23 or 24? And if you could, where's, where do you find the sequence on the 24th in the chimp? Um, I don't know whether, a, whether we have an entire picture. Um, that would be worth bringing back to class if somebody has one that, uh, in fact, it shouldn't be that hard to just take what we have of the chimp and human chromosomes and align them. And I'm going to show you where that's been done for one chromosome. So that you'll have some idea of what's going on. Well, it would seem to me that either argument would uh, be strengthened or severely weakened by a across-the-board comparison. We're going we're gonna to come to one piece of that at the very end, if, uh, if I planned this correctly. So, we'll see. Uh, yes? Let me interject at this point. Um, it strikes me as very strange that the chimp genome hasn't been fully sequenced at this point in history. Um, we'll uh, s save that question for the very end, but it's a good question. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, this entire region of that's right. It, it, it only aligns with other chromosomes. Um, okay. Chimps and other apes have, uh, this is uh, part F. Chimps and other apes have very distinctive and very large satellite sequences at the end of their chromosomes. They're found just before the terminal telomeric tips. It's like they have, you know, the telomeres and then they have kind of like bookends. Almost like labeling this is chimp chromosome. <coughs> These are typically made up of a very prominent 32 base tandem repeating sequence. These large subtelomeric repeat structures are in all ape genomes but are absent in man. So whatever process happened, obviously those got kind of shaved off. The bookends were gone. These high copy satellite subtelomeric sequences are the genetic basis of the heterochromatic knobs seen at the end of ape chromosomes which presumably are not there in humans, which are large enough to be seen even with a light microscope. So we're talking, you know, probably thousands, hundreds of thousands of bases maybe. It's, it's huge. It's big enough you can see it. Therefore, these large ape-specific satellite sequences should be seen flanking the RFS to both sides, but they are not there. The ape-specific satellite DNA is completely absent in the region of the RFS. This is a very serious problem for the egg fusion hypothesis. However, this observation is not necessarily inconsistent with the human fusion hypothesis because we don't have those. That, it, uh, that is, hu two human chromosomes fusing in the early human population could have, could have happened. Um, part G, while the expected subtelomeric repeats are not present in the region of the RFS, there is a gene called DDX. 11 L2 immediately adjacent to the RFS as we will soon see this gene is not just adjacent to the RFS it actually contains the RFS this gene is homologous to a gene family that is usually found in close, close proximity to human telomeres at first this might seem to support the fusion hypothesis since the RFS is found close to a gene typically seen near telomeres. Um, however, we need to look more closely. A similar family of genes is also found in the chimp genome. While these genes are also generally found toward the end of the uh, chimp chromosomes, but apparently separated by this satellite sequence, um, they're uh, separated from the telomere by a sizable amount of intervening DNA. That's the one we talked about in the last point. So if we assume that the DDX, 
L, uh, uh, 11L2 gene on chromosome 2 came from an ape fusion, it should be separated from the telomere-like fusion site by this large ape-specific tandem repeat. So if there's a fusion, there's a bunch of carving that had to go on if you're going to make it from apes to humans. Absence of this intervening DNA between the DXX... Yeah, this is DDX and I... That's their mistake, I think, because I just copied that. Uh, DXXL... Uh, 11L2 gene and the RFS is not consistent with the idea that a fusion occurred in the ape population, in an ape population. However, this is not inconsistent with a fusion in a very early human population because within the human genome, this family, a gene family is, tip, is typically a directly adjacent to the telomere. So you kind of expect that if it was a human fusion, if it's an ape fusion, then you've got to cut out a bunch of stuff. H, this gene, the gene described above, DDX, it is DDX, I'm sure that DXX is just a misprint. Um, 11L2 is called a pseudogene. We have already explained that pseudogenes are not generally junk DNA, but are generally functional genes. They just don't produce protein. They produce RNA, which interacts with the other RNA and uh, governs the protein. This particular gene is similar to a telomere-associated gene family, which is DDX11L, which encodes an RNA helicase protein. Like many functional pseudogenes, DDX, uh, and I think they goofed it again, DDX, probably, 11L2, does not produce a protein, yet it still makes a variety of RNA, uh, so it's as functional and not junk. Remarkably, this gene is not only immediately adjacent to the RFS, it actually overlaps with the fusion site. More accurately, the RFS is actually a functional part of the DDX11L2 gene. The, people who, the person who discovered this and who has investigated this entire issue more than any other scientist is Dr. Jeff Tompkins, a longtime gen genomicist and the longtime director of the DNA sequencing facility at Clem Clemson University. Those of you who follow football may remember something about Clemson University. Uh, <clears throat> Tompkins has recently published compelling evidence that the RFS is not a fusion site at all, but it is a functional component of the DDX11L2 gene. It actually works. He has shown that the RFS lies within the first intron of this gene. Furthermore, he has shown that the RFS sequence has the following attributes. One, it is an active promoter for the transcription of an alternate transcript. Two, it binds at least 12 transcription factors. And three, it initiates RNA transcription, which begins within its own sequence. So it, it's not just junk. If there's been a fusion somehow this stuff has actually been remodeled to the point where it works. Which is pretty amazing. Four, it has a chromatin profile that further supports its active promoter status. Tompkins also provides evidence that the D, I'm sure that should be DDX, uh, 11L2 gene product produces RNA that helps regulate the D the XL um, gene family, just as had been shown with other functional pseudogenes. I'm going to have to go back and look at the original articles to find out which is the original pattern there. Uh, <clears throat> unless all of these many levels of evidence can be refuted, it appears that, the Tomk that Tompkins has successfully falsified the hypothesis that the RFS is a fusion site. The fused chromosome hypothesis not only requires demonstration of a legitimate fusion site, it also requires demonstration of a disabled second centromere, what you might call a cryptic centromere, on chromosome 2. Remember, if you fuse it, now you have something that has two centromeres, one on one side, one on the other, right? Something has to grab those chromosomes and pull them apart and so forth when you're doing meiosis. And you can't have two of them. So one of them has to degenerate. 
In the very same paper, Tompkins also scrutinized the reputed cryptic centromere. He shows that the 171 base pair repeat that characterizes primate centromeres is indeed present within the RCC, but this repeat sequence is also present in many, many other parts of the human genome, and so the fact that it's there is not terribly impressive. Tompkins shows that the RCC is much too small and the exact sequence is too human to be the remains of an ancient chip centrum, chimp centromere. So if it did become human, then instead of totally degenerating, because you don't need ape stuff anymore, it becomes more human. It's selected for being more human. How do you do that without it being functional? Similar, by the way, to what he found in the RFS. This would be impossible if the true RCC was ever a real centromere. Well, technically not impossible, but improbable to, you know, to need multiple universes to explain it. This strongly falsifies the hypothesis that there is an ancient secondary disabled centromere on human chromosome two. It seems that there are profound problems with both the hypothetical fusion site and also the hy hypothetical cryptic centromere. So the evidence for a chromosome two fusion seems to be collapsing. Even if it could be shown that a fusion did occur in the general vicinity of the RFS, and there was strong support for a cryptic centromere, it would still not be evidence for ape to human evolution. Early man might have originally had two chromosomes that fused early in human history to yield what is now cr human chromosome two, converting a genome of 24 chromosome pairs into a genome of 23 chromosome pairs. However, in the light of Tompkins' new data, even a fusion in early human history now appears to be very unlikely. There's no, no direct evidence for any type of fusion. And their conclusion, genetic barriers to ape to man evolution are insurmountable. Neither the fossil record nor genetics can be used to prove the ape to man story. Ironically, during the last two decades, many previous claims of genetic evidence of ape to man evolution have been overturned. More and more, the genetic evidence is indicating that ape to man, ape to human evolution is not credible. In fact, genetics now prove provides the very strongest arguments against human evolution. Now, am I taking all this? I think this is, as I said before, it's an ad example of claiming more than is warranted, particularly for, for the human chromosome two. That story is desperately needed by the theory of common descent, and yet, you know, creationists could take it or leave it, and uh, the only advantage that the evolutionists have is they say, well, see, my theory needs this, and it's not falsified, and therefore my theory gains weight. Well, it probably gains some weight, if it were true. Um, again, it's as if creations use the Yellowstone fossil forest reevaluation as a proof of the creationist time scale. Only thing it can do is incur be encouraging evidence. But what if it isn't really there? It's nice to have predictive power in your theory, but it's not proof that the other theory is wrong. However, if it turns out that there isn't a, fum a, a chromosomal fusion, then that's a major argument against evolutionary theory. Now, what if the evidence doesn't back your claim? You're left then with essentially a falsification of your theory. And that's true after you have called attention to the fact that your theory needs the facts to be otherwise. You're, you are then left with discrediting the opposition. Now, Tompkins doesn't know what he's talking about. He's a creationist yokel and he's lying for Jesus. Why would they say that? Because they don't have any other arguments. If the facts are on your side, pound the facts. If the law is on your side, pound the law. If neither is on your side, pound the table. Now we're gonna go and look at those two uh, references that we talked about. One of them is 
both of them are on the internet. One of them is in uh, PNAS, and the other one is in Answers Research Journal, I know, it's creations, but Jeff Tompkins was, until he decided to write creationist stuff, a respected geneticist. By the way, as was uh, uh, John Sanford. Um, again, you can look at the articles and you can look at the evidence and decide for yourself. Now, for the vision inclined, I'm going to give you a schematic of diffusion theory from Tompkins. I'm going to give you the actual DNA s sequence of the RFS from the PNAS article. And I'm going to give you the pseudogene that spans the RFS, again, from Tompkins. And here's the, the general schematic. And if you will notice here, the cryptic centimere, centromere, okay, so this is about the right length. But you will notice that it looks like there should be a bunch of this chopped off in order to make it work. And there should be a bunch of this chopped off. We should not see an RFS. We should have seen a crossing over if it's just uh, a, a chromosome fusion. Um, the centromere here, of course, carried through, and that's the one that is used in chromosome two to pull it apart. Uh, and interestingly enough, this area here is significantly shorter than the human chromosome two. Now, when we get done, I'm gonna show you some plots and it would be fascinating to see how those plots lined up. Here is the actual fusion uh, sequence. Now, if you will look here, these ones that are circled, in red in one case, in uh, cyan in the other, are the correct uh, sequence, TTA, GGG. But you'll notice here it's TTT, GGG, here it's TTT, GGGG. Um, every single one of these that is not circled is kind of similar, but not exactly. And so every one of those has a mistake of some kind. Now sometimes they're too short. TA, if you just add another T, you'd have a perfect match. But that causes a frame shift. Um, Here's one that's too long. There's a bunch of them that are too long. You know, you can look over it and see every single one of them. So every single one of them has at least one mistake, at least one. So there's at least one sixth of them missing there, which means that 86% uh, and some of them have more than one mistake. Um, and then they get to here and you'll notice that uh, this is a little short, it should be TTT or pardon me, TTAG, and then it just chops off. And then it resumes here, and now everything is backwards. So it looks, you know, pretty good. But if you look at it, again, you have a significant number of ones that are just wrong. Here's one that has five, another one that has five. Here's one that has, oh, they got it over enthusiastic. There's eight there. You know, um, and you know, some of them will have one base uh, wrong. Um, so then, uh, by the way, once you get beyond the, these these spots, it, it goes completely haywire. You can't you can't do those kinds of uh, alignments. But that gives you an idea of why when they said it's only seventy percent, well, they're right. And it's not just 70%, it's also, you know, indels. Pardon me? This is taken from the paper. This is a sequence. So it's just one. One sequence. Okay. This is that sequence. If you were to clone it and various other people, you'd probably find one or two mistakes in there somewhere uh, compared with this, assuming this is original. Uh, but basically, you'd have that sequence. That's what you get. So that's as far as they've gone. 
Um, well, it, originally there's a whole se there's you know sequence above and sequence below, and so there's a bunch of stuff there. Um, but this is this is the part of the sequence that they say is matching telomeres. But as you can see, it's pretty highly degenerate. Uh, if this just happened in the last, uh, I don't know, four million years or something. The, this, is the, this is the forward sequence, and right there is where it fuses with the, reverse, with the inverted sequence. So where is the RFS? Artifact? RFS, is it? Oh, this whole thing is RFS, okay? Okay. Um, uh, this, this is the telomere A coming in and then telomere B coming out. But as you can see, they're kind of, uh, and you'll notice also that they're a little bit asymmetric. There's a more of telomere B than there is a telomere A. I don't know whether they're really A or B. How, it depends on how you label them, but uh, you know what I'm saying. The, the, the incoming one and then the outgoing one, um, uh, they didn't fuse right on time. They fused a little bit off. But you notice even then, when cancer cells do it, they don't have just this short sequence. They have long, long sequences that fuse. So why it's this short is, is a mystery, unless maybe they were damaged ends that got together. And here's the, the, the fusion site is in here, and you will notice that it's part of the transcriptor binding factors. It actually is useful, and it actually produces this kind of where exon 2 and exon 3 are together. Um, but you can transcribe it using it as an intron as well, which is an indication that, that uh, something that's well known now, introns can sometimes be functional as more than just introns. They're not just pieces to cut out and paste together they actually have properties of their own. And in this particular case, it can bind and transcribe. Now, the summary that we just went through is the best concise source I've seen. And among the best sources for the genetic controversy regarding the supposed ape to man transition. The, the only one that I can think of right now that would be better is to go back to Tompkins' original. The only criticism uh, I would include uh, in this chapter is that I really wish they had included the human Y chromosome data. You may remember that um, this is the reference and, and, and here's the chromosome 21, which Tompkins points out, it may not be quite this good because they actually l match the chimp to the human anyway. And so this line may be partly artificial I notice that the ends, the, 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 there's some ends on the chimpanzee that are not in the human. That are those satellite sequences, okay? Um, and this presumably goes from five to three. I don't know whether it's really five to three or three to five, as it could have gone either way. Um, that makes it easier to see, thanks, Jeff. Um, and you can see that although there's some thin areas there and there's some parts in that uh, multiple parts in the human that line up with the chimpanzee and vice versa and uh, you can see there's a number of those um, those are probably repeats of some kind um, maybe some of those r reproducible elements that by and large most of it lines up pretty good Somebody tells me that that's 99%, I go, yeah, maybe. Yeah, well, it's 99% except for those little a ends, so that makes it not it's down to 98, but whatever. Now, there's the human Y chromosome. Some of you have seen it, and it's crazy. And you can see there's some parts of the chimpanzee that don't even match anything on the human and vice versa, except for that little point right there. Uh, it's just, 
it's just amazing. And even more is the fact that this actually should be going this way instead of this way if, uh, if it were really matching. So you can see there's a lot of non-matching stuff. Uh, it's going to make me do go through that all. Um, now the rhesus macaque monkey has been done, and there's a reference for those of you who want it. And you can see the rhesus macaque matching human maybe some, yeah, but it's a really kind of all scattered around. And the same way with the rhesus with, with the chimp. And you can see all of the, um, you know, those uh, palindromes that match both ways. And here is the pig Y chromosome. The Y chromosome is on the bottom with almost no matches. Now it's interesting, even the X chromosome is kind of weird, and you'll notice the pig doesn't match the cow or the sheep, which should be its closest relatives. Instead, it matches the dog and the cat, which are not its closest relatives. And it also matches the human and the chimp, oddly enough, um, which do not match their closest relatives, the rabbit, the mouse, and the rat. That's the X chromosome, by the way. That's not the Y. The Y is that stuff down below where there's almost no match. Um, and, and then I was rooting around in uh, Wikipedia trying to learn about syntony and um, to get an idea of what it's talking about. And um, they had a reference to this article in uh, uh, Bioinformatics. And here is all of the mouse chromosomes lined up. And you can see that, yeah, there's some of one on human one. Um, interesting that there's more of two in human 20 than any place else. Uh, but I want to call your attention to the fact that human Y is completely white. The, this is not a complete match. This is, a, I think, an enzyme match. But still, it's just amazing that the human Y and the mouse Y don't match at all. And that, by the way, gives you an idea. If, if you're doing the chimpanzee and the human, you can imagine, you know, the, the bars being pretty much the same and then all of a sudden near the, near the transition, you're going to have a little piece of nine, a little piece of 12. Just think about it. Anyway, the human Y in the, uh, is only vaguely sim uh, similar to the chimpanzee Y and they're both different from the rhesus Y. And the next question, of course, is what about chimps and bonobos? I get the feeling, I have not been able to trace down where I can see data, but I get the feeling from the way they write that chimps and bonobos are awfully close, raising the question of whether there was only one pair that came out of the ark. What about wolves, uh, chimpan you know, chimps and gorillas? I don't know. I haven't seen, a, I haven't seen any data on that. Dogs, wolves, coyotes, dingoes, foxes, big cats, little cats, lions, you know, tigers. Um, it would be fascinating to look at that data from the human Y chromosome. We may be able to create a family tree. It would be interesting. Um, and then there is new data that coming out that uh, I talked about before we got started uh, about human mitochondria, ape mitochondria, um, it turns out that there's a whole bunch of different species that they've used certain sections of them as what they call barcode data. And the data suggests that all of them are about 200,000 years old. And if you redo that with actual mitochondrial data, it's coming out to be more like 6,000 years old. Um, could you say it's 6,000 instead of 4,000? I don't know. But it's fascinating to look at and to start asking questions and hopefully 
We'll be doing that is just as soon as we get done with the book. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Does that answer some of those questions you were having? I'm trying to recall my question. <laughs> But the, but the more basic issue here is uh, uh, these basic assumptions that were just taken for granted. Well, the thing I see is it looks to me like people got excited about the possibility and they just kind of overlooked all of the problems that would be involved. You know, it's as if Aha, uh -huh, we have an idea of, of you know, who killed the, 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 the uh, subject. It must have been, uh, you know, uh, his ex-girlfriend. She has a motive. She owns the kind of gun he, that shot him. But then when you come to find out that she was in Hawaii at the time, you know, uh, and, he, and he was... Uh, you know, he died in Los Angeles. Well, now it starts to get more complicated. And see, what I see is, well, it's but, great, except that now you have, how did we get rid of the subtelomeric stuff? How did we get chromosome mm -hmm. 9 material in there? How did we get chromosome 12 material in there? Suddenly, the it, you start having this horribly complicated way of trying to fit it together. Yeah, but it's, it's all built up on an assumption that uh, uh, could could be entirely different. Uh, well, it's built up with the assumption that you know that she must have done it. Well, that that's the problem. <laughs> yeah, that's the problem. That's exactly the problem. And so I see this as starting to get pretty close to a falsification. <coughs> At least for apes and humans. Which is a big warning to all of us. Yeah, but beyond we, that... We build up on... Uh, without realizing that we're drifting. Beyond that, I think it should, I, I don't want to disrespect science proper, the actual data that people get out of it, but I do want to be very cautious about when people try to fit the data into a theory, because that's where the problem is. And that really, that's what's happening is that we're seeing science hijacked by an anti-biblical uh, anti viewpoint. When you start talking, as mm -hmm. Charles Lyell did in private, about freeing the science from Moses, you already know that Moses was wrong. But so supposing the apes uh, did it or the humans did it, uh, what does, this doesn't demonstrate evolution at all. Of course it doesn't. I, I think this is one of these places where we can feel pretty comfortable that our theory actually stands up pretty well and their theory has huge difficulties. Well, they, they've certainly gone to a lot of effort on the basis of a false assumption. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it could be testing an ID, but it's... Uh, yeah. The, the conclusion is so prevalent in there uh, throughout the, the discussion and the conclusion is unwarranted. Yeah. Is there any controversy regarding that um, among the scientists? Uh, why don't we pass the mic because you may want to have a follow-up question there. Is there any controversy among the scientists? Um, 
Well, the question that you're really asking is, does it get into the scientific literature? Right, because if there's controversy among scientists, but they say it, when the sound waves die out against the walls, nobody knows. You see, you, you see does it get into the peer-reviewed literature? Well, there's some obstacles for it getting in. Um, uh, it would be interesting to see if somebody else could write the same stuff that Jeff Thompson's did, uh, phrase it in a slightly different way and see if it could get into PNAS, for example. Mm. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if anybody has tried in that way. And it would take somebody with a certain kind of writing skill to be able to do that. Mm. I do know that the information is out there and you can find it and you can look at it for yourself. Um, can we get any kind of consensus? Uh, you know, we may not be, we may be stuck with not having consensus in this situation. Because try to imagine writing an article like Tompkins has written and getting it into, I mean, even going through and shaving a bunch of stuff out so it doesn't look quite so bad, and, and getting it into a, a, some kind of peer-reviewed journal. What was the source, the original source of that then? Wh which one? Of the, um, of the sequencing. The sequencing is in the, is in the literature. That one is actually in the peer-reviewed literature. University? Uh, it's a, it's a Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of the USA. US. Which is, you know, kind of, uh, that, that was the one that said, ha, we found it. See, look, it almost matches. Well, 70% match, but you know, So that one got in. And they just didn't go much further than that. And they didn't deal with what do you do with the ape satellite chromosomes that need to be is, is omitted. They didn't deal with any of those other questions. It was just, it's very simple. You got this, that's where you go. And, and see, it's, it's nice if you just don't ask questions. But then if you start asking questions, suddenly it becomes much, much more difficult. How did Hichi get from Hawaii to California? <laughs> uh, um, Doug. Um, yeah, so I remember my question. That is, at this point in time when a full human genome sequence can be obtained for less than $1,000. Uh, Why hasn't somebody done one for chimps? Yeah. Well, let me explain. There, there are at least two ways, and there are probably more than this, but there are at least two common ways of getting uh, large s sequences of DNA. One of them is what they call the shotgun method. And that is you send something in to chop up the DNA into pieces. And you clone those pieces, <coughs> and then you sequence those pieces, and you hope that it doesn't always cut in the same place so that you'll have a sequence of a thousand bases that goes and then here's uh, 500 bases exactly match this part that goes on for 1500 bases and you know it's very much like matching tree rings um, only it's probably more secure because if you get a lock out of you know 496 of the, five, uh, uh, of the 500 matches the chances of that not being a, a good match are pretty slim. Now, are they zero? No, and the reason why is because there are repeating sequences. And so if one of them is, let's say, an ALU, and you got an ALU at the beginning and an ALU at the end, is that the same ALU, or is there another piece? Um, and so in order to make those things fit over millions of bases, which is what you're talking about when you're 
talking about a, a single human or chimp chromosome, then what's nice is to have a human chromosome you can line up the chimp chromosome with. And so now you take your thousand bases and say, oh yeah, it must fit here. And then this other one must fit here and it must fit there. And, and hopefully you've got, and if you've got say, you know, 90% coverage, you say, oh, we did pretty well. Well, you'd like to know what is that, that you know, the last five, uh, last end and kind of in the middle and so forth. And you're always worried about the possibility that a chimp flips and an ALU is on one end and on the other end and so you'd never know whether it flipped or not. So if you're gonna be more careful, which is how they did the human Y chromosome, by the way. The, the human chromosome 21, the one that matched so well, is, as I understand it, mostly shotgun sequencing. Okay, so of course it lines up because we made it line up. But it lines up pretty good, so you'd, you'd have to say, yeah, we'll take that. Okay, uh, technically what you should do is grow long pieces of chromosomes inside a bacterium. And, and there you can have, you know, instead of, you know, 1,000, 1,500 bases, now you could have, um, say, a tenth of the chromosome or so. And if you sequence that, then you're pretty com comfortable that it's all one sequence. And that's how they did the human Y, and that's how they found out that it was totally disorganized. Even though there are pieces that, you know, from a shotgun, if you line them up against a human, you can say, oh, there's 70% uh, the same. Well, yeah, but uh, the organization is totally, you know, shattered. And, and so it matters how you do it. So if you're going to do it, you have to do this bacterial long thing, uh, which is a technically more difficult uh, piece. And granted, you know, you could sequence that once you got it fairly cheaply. The problem is getting it in the first place. So it's, it's not quite the same thing as, uh, as, uh, as just simply doing, you know, a, a couple of genes lined up with each other or something. Does that answer the... I, yeah, I think so. In other words, you're saying there, there is a technical challenge to truly doing a really good quality, full human, human genome sequence. Yeah. Yeah, and if you assume that they're the same, then you can line up the shotgun sequences and you can, you know, you can go home and declare victory, but really you haven't done the whole work. Yeah. So going back to my earlier question, none of the apes... Uh, genome has been fully sequenced. I may be misstating because I don't know what the latest thing has come out in the last two weeks is. Sure. But uh, my understanding is that no, it has not been completely sequenced. <coughs> uh, most of what we have is the shotgun stuff and as you can see from chromosome 21, they've got pretty good alignment if you make those assumptions. Uh, when they did the Y and did it the hard way, it blew everybody's minds. Hmm. Well, it does seem like an, an important enough type of information for the big questions. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm surprised that somebody isn't ponying up the funding to do it. Well, I, I will tell you the truth. I have presented this in a few places saying, you know, look here, we can do this stuff, it's going to be fascinating. Um, and um, most, of the, most of the time the response I've gotten was, yeah, that's a good idea, somebody should do that. Right. <laughs> or is there perhaps concern that at that level the data will be too confusing for the given well, let, let proposals. Well, let me put it this way. I finally got some people here at Loma Linda University excited about doing this. And then I discovered that um, uh, one of the key people they would have to work with uh, is an evolutionist. 
So, um, I mean, I'm not going to say who or what or anything like that. Obviously, we're not going to, at this point, not going to go there. But, but it's, you know, it, it turns out to be a little more complicated than it sounds. I, I do know that we're still, we still have some enthusiasm for doing it. And I think that before long, we will have some graduate students here t working on this very kind of problem. And after what I hope to present in three weeks, I think that we will have some very excited people doing this. Because mitochondria are cheap. And if we can do barcodes, and there's no reason why we can't just, just do barcodes of the standard variety, but barcodes of some other parts of mitochondria, and mitochondria are like Y chromosomes in the sense that they're not quite as absolute as Y chromosomes. You only get one Y chromosome from your dad and that's it. Um, but you do get 23 on the average uh, to 28, something like that, uh, uh, mitochondria from your mom and that's it. Um, rarely a sperm will contribute one or two mitochondria. Most of the time this, the mitochondria and the sperm are lost. Uh, but if, uh, you know, so, but it's pretty close to a matriarchal line. And if that's the case, then it looks like from the data we have that we will be able to do mitochondrial lines. And, and, the, and not only that, but we have some data as to how fast mitochondria mutate. And if, if you're being fair, it's going to be interesting to see whether that lines up with the flood and, you know, roughly how many thousand years ago. Yes. What types of classroom materials or books would this kind of research be oh, included in? Oh, boy. <laughs> what, I mean, what, who, who will read this? Well, I am tempted to say that's not my job. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is this, is this anthropology? Is, it, is this biology? Is this? Uh, I would think that this kind of thing should come up in a, uh, in a, 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 a fourth year biology um, a college course. I would think that it would easily be comprehensible by the, the people who are doing that. And that, uh, you know, it could be it could be biology and, um, and religion. And I think we ought to have a class like that. We should have a class in geology and religion. And we should have a class in uh, uh, physics and religion. We really should have mm -hmm. where they tackle not only the general you know, physics, but does, how does this interact with uh, uh, Adventist faith, Christian faith, um, faith in God in general, faith in a some kind of supreme uh, intelligent being. I have to say amen to that. Yeah, that's right. And I would think that some of these things would be certainly comprehensible by people who are taking high school biology. And maybe after we get done with the obligatory evolutionary biology part of our textbook, we could pull the human Y chromosome in, show them the pictures, let them decide for themselves whether it looks like it, it, it descended from the same animal. Because I think you look at the picture and you go, there's no way. There's just no way. And you don't have to do a bunch of technical arguments. You just, the picture. When you realize that they put an ape in a human picture, and they both have eyes, and they both have mouths, and they, you know, and they look, well, kind of maybe similar, and if you pick the right human and the right ape, it, 
you know, you get a little imagination. And then you put that thing up and you say, is that the same animal? And, and people walk away with, no, that just doesn't make sense. And I think that at least some of those arguments should be transferable down to at least the high school level. Some of these, I think, could probably be understood at, um, say, grade five through eight. They fired you. I have a curriculum you follow. It takes years to develop that. Yeah. They'd fire you. They would, yes. If they found you were teaching, we, we got it. they would say you're not teaching the curriculum and you'd be fired. Well, you know, I, I, I want to I make a point. Somebody develops the curriculum. Yes, and they'd never put it in there. Uh, well, maybe, maybe for public school they wouldn't. But, you know, we have Adventist schools. We're trying to develop our own curriculum. See, we've, this we, kind of thing should be in it. We, we already have the science program, the updated. I spent 25 years in the old one, five years in the new one. It, it needs to be in the form of an addendum. Or, you know, they're, it's very expensive to change textbooks, but there's no reason that, first it needs to come to teachers. Yeah. First, it, it needs to come to the knowledge of those who are presenting material. Well, before it even comes to teachers, it needs to come to those curriculum people that are doing this. And they could say, you know, we have all this other stuff and we got it, but you know, we really need a day on this thing. See, they hire teachers. Which is really an hour on this thing. They, they will hire teachers for three or four summers to work on curriculum. They go back to Washington, D.C., and they work on it for three or four summers. Teachers from, you know, many different states, and many different grade levels. Mm -hmm. And then they pull it all together, and that's our new textbook. But, that's and that's wonderful. The only thing I see is this that some way when they're making that curriculum they need those teachers to be talking to the top conservative scientists to say what are the things that we think your kids should know mm -hmm. passing through mm -hmm. so because we've just our school alone Loma Linda Academy elementary just the elementary school spent $75,000 on the new science curriculum. So how often can you, you know, do that sort of thing? Well, not often. But my question is, maybe I should be the one to make the phone call back there, is about other materials that, that can come to teachers. Most of our teachers are in little schools, uh, maybe one or two teachers, I mean, most of North America are small schools. Yeah. Well, you know, I hate to put too much more load on the GRI because they're already overtaxed. They're supposed to do research and they're supposed to, to spread the research and... Um, that's here, right? Yeah, that's GRI, here. That's yeah. the institute here. They get uh, that to the GC? Uh, they, have, they have outlets where they spread this, but it's mostly spread uh, up at the university level, and uh, we really need to get this down lower, I think, some of it. Some of it, not all of it. But there need to be some of the really crucial parts that need to be in there. And what we need to have is we need to have people talking to each other, some of whom know what is possible to say, and some of whom will know, you know, the, the ways to say it to kids that will make sense. And, and come together with some kind of, you know, an update for this year, an update for next year. I mean, I think every student, every student in, our, uh, in our schools, and I don't know how far down we need to go, but we should certainly start with college. And we oh. probably should go earlier than that. Oh, yeah. I, 
uh, we, we should know that there are footprints in Crete that are fully human, that are, uh, that are supposed to be 5.7 million years old. That destroys the entire block where they've been mm -hmm. trying to fit human to apes. We had a page and a half in the fourth grade science book on the flood was a page and a half. And it was, it was more than the old science book, which we didn't have we any. Just, we had nothing about the flood, but um, a page and a half was was really just an overview of um, that. There was a picture of the Grand Canyon, and there was a picture of. Um, I didn't have Mount St. Helens because they the work on it was. Uh -huh. done years before that uh, the Grand Canyon and um, I think there's a picture of the petrified forest well that's not enough <laughs> no it's not enough a you're right and, a half. And, and the thing of it is what it should be is uh, if I can say this picking on particularly rich sub subjects that can be that can be comprehended in one uh, and, and mm -hmm. in fact people can tease the kids of uh, interest and then give them the references to look up on their own. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Make them interested in science uh, because mm -hmm. science is intensely interesting mm -hmm. if you pick the right subject. And many schools now are having enough computers where almost every student can have one, or if they do fundraising, every student can have one at their desk, so. And if um, they're connected to the internet, they can look mm -hmm. up a reference A, and you can read the original literature for yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think kids need to get used to thinking that way about mm -hmm. science, that, that science is not the homogenized mess, the sausage that's being fed to you. Science is, in fact, some very interesting pieces of information and the attempt to fit them together. And the problem is that when evolutionists do the sausage making, there are certain ingredients that are left out. Hmm. And there are other ingredients that are emphasized way more than they really ought to be. I mean, how many of you have run into that we're 99% chimp? Yeah, that's sausage. They have a film on that that they have you show the kids. Right after that, somebody needs to put a critique. At least for private schools that that have a vested interest in religion rather than just, you know, wanting to spoon feed people what the popular problem is. Because you know that they can't be 90, we can't be 99% chimp if our genomes don't actually match. That, 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 if, that if they're 3.3 bases and we're 3.3 uh, 3 .3 billion bases and we're 3 billion bases, then there's 10% missing. So somewhere in there, you know, it's been carved off. And when you look at the Y chromosome, you realize that we're not anywhere close to 99% chimp. And what's really being done is people are getting spoon-fed truths that aren't really true. And in fact, you could turn that 99% chimp video into a powerful lesson for kids. Don't believe everything you see. Part of the problem is following the Common Core, the standards of the Common Core. Yeah, well, That's part of the problem. I understand that Common Core is finding some uh, critics, shall we say, mm -hmm. and there's probably good reason for that. Uh, the fact of the matter is that people who have managed to worm themselves into the 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 innards of Common Core 
now get to set the agenda for the entire company or the entire country and because a lot of people copy the U.S., it uh, actually goes beyond our mm -hmm. shores. So, uh, uh, but I mean, we, uh, where we do have to deal with the Common Core, we should deal with it, but we should have, let's say, supplements? Yeah, supplements, right. Uh, where we don't have to deal with Common Core, if we're making our own science curriculum, as I understand we're doing it now, we should incorporate things like this. Part of the par uh, problem of developing the curriculum is, is they do bring in teachers. And when you teach, you don't have time to keep up with the newest developments. That's right. And <laughs> so they just keep going over the same things in books. Right. Right. California and Texas are the ones that determine what is in the books because they're the largest states with the largest student population. So Maryland, which, you know, is small, has to choose, or all of the states, choose which books are You're going to go Texas or you're going to go to, California. Yeah, California. And so then eventually they go, you know, the, mm -hmm. the manufacturers are not going to produce two separate books. I mean, there's different books out there, but uh, the old comment is it takes 50 years for new stuff to get into the textbooks. <laughs> oh. So Too you, late. All, you all are <laughs> dreaming. <laughs> Well, let me put this. Um, if we don't dream, it's yeah, not going to happen. Wrong with it, but. It's not going to happen. And it's, uh, you know, the Bible has a comment uh, without vision, the people perish. Right. Yeah. An another thing that's happening is they're changing the standardized testing. And if Avatus schools are going to stay. I'll use the word afloat, and, and keep encouraging parents to bring their children to Avenda schools, then we need to be teaching curriculum that the public schools are teaching. So our school is about to adopt this next year the social studies curriculum, which is, when I went to the meeting three years ago, we had the choice between three books. And I, I quickly was going through it like this to see how are they dealing with, uh, you know, Adventist type uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> concerns. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's going to need it's. Our school here is adopting uh, Macmillan, I think. I can't remember now. Maybe a hard curtain uh -huh. brace. Um, there were three choices, and it was okay. Let's. They had the teachers from all of uh, Pacific Union Conference there to look and to talk about and give input, and then they were going to choose one of the books. So, mm. uh, it's just frustrating. Well, you know what? It's I'm going to make a suggestion. You mentioned that teachers are up to their eyeballs in work. Um, what that means is that there's going to have to be some experienced teachers who maybe no longer teach and actually <laughs> have some time to look at this and are able to go back and say, you know what, this is part of what we need. Yeah. Uh, and maybe teachers who really don't like bureaucracies and you know, who, who committee meetings are dull and unimportant until you realize that that's what's going to set the stage for all of your younger colleagues. Yeah. And that means that we're going to need, if you want to call it that, activists. Mm -hmm. There is a place for everybody you will not find 
that you have nothing to do. Oh, and if you're retired, <laughs> you may find that you can actually be more potent than some poor teacher who is struggling to keep ahead of, uh, you know, uh, an entire fourth grade class teaching all subjects, uh, which happens in some places. Yeah. You know, uh, you've been there, you know what's going on. I think that that's one of the things that's going to need to happen is we're going to have to get people actually working on this stuff. We're going to have to, if you want that to happen, we're going to have to value the teacher because the teacher is the base for all learning. Yeah. And right now, what you pay a teacher in an Adventist school isn't going to make it. It's going to take lots of money. Well, but no. education is, <laughs> although I think the Adventists are worlds ahead of public education they you know if you don't value your teachers they've got to make a living wage as it is said and in Adventist schools you don't do that in fact at uh, coming out of college you produce more teachers than you need so they end up going into public education but at the same time, you need to also pay those teachers what they're worth. And right now you're telling teachers they're not worth very much. And so your best and brightest do not go into that. Well. They go into medicine. <laughs> mm. <laughs> No, uh, no, really. When I was in college, they told me I should go into medicine. I know. You wouldn't have made a living as a teacher. I don't know about um, college, but in grade school, I taught. I taught four years in the Adventist system. I was lucky, number one, to get a job. And then number two, we lived in the Washington, D.C. area, and That's probably expensive. my pay was exactly half of what they pay in public schools. Public school teachers in certain areas now are making $100,000 a year, and that's not recent. That's the benefits. Plus, they get health care, they get life insurance, you just live differently. Yeah. When you teach you choose. Yeah, you choose that. You, you, just, you just live differently. But you, can't want, you cannot live unless you have a spouse in an area like that unless you have support. You just can't make it financially. You would have nothing. We have a comment we, back We here. first need to recognize we are in a crisis. You look at the bill that's going through California Senate at the moment, that's going to ban even a Christian counselor from being able to give any counsel from scripture. And if we don't realize we're in a crisis, we're going to start looking for $100,000 a year, and that ain't going to be. We don't have the money. Now the other point is, great discussion, I went through half my life in a Christian schools or Adventist schools, and the other half in state schools, so I really do know the difference. But the point is this. We, that caters for one third or a quarter of our children in our church. We have to produce these supplements or whatever you want to call them that can go out that are so exciting and in a sense it's our Sabbath schools that need to be radically revised. Yes. The Sabbath school is the key to, and of the heart of the church. If we cannot mobilize our Sabbath schools to really be exciting times for the children so that they want two hours of Sabbath school every Sabbath morning I mean, when I was a kid, we managed to do it. We were 16, 17 year olds and we took the primary Sabbath school class and it became a riot. In fact, we got reprimanded, but the kids were having a great time. It can be done, but something has to be done. Otherwise, we might as well just give up altogether. Well, I, I think the one thing is, there is material out there. Wonderful stuff. I think this can be done. I think that 
it's a matter of uh, people who are interested and some people who are knowledgeable. The interested people don't even have to be all knowledgeable. They can learn on the job. Uh, but we need to have uh, people concentrating on getting this stuff to the kids um, and to the new converts and to uh, the, the world in general. Um, and it probably is not going to be able to be done on the Oprah show because I don't think she's that interested in it. You know, which means that we're going to have to be doing it, you know, uh, in various other ways. And we're, we're going to, I mean, this, this Sabbath school here is an attempt to do this kind of thing. We mustn't underestimate Oprah, who I don't like at all. But right yesterday in the YouTube, plonked up this thing. Oprah says the s Sabbath is Saturday. So let's not underestimate what God can do. Well, well, we'll see what happens. I mean, we may get some surprises along the way. Yeah, she, she's done that before too. I, I don't yeah. In other words, let's not underestimate what can be done. The point is, if we don't do anything, nothing will be done. Exactly. If it's just us, then we better start. <laughs> That's right. And we, we start in the corner where we're at, but we enlarge our vision beyond the corner where we're at to say what could be done and then if we're not able to do it ourselves, we enroll other people to help. So somebody must come up in a week or two with a little outline saying this could be done. And then we break it down into six or seven components and we do it. Okay. Even if it's only a dummy in black and white. <laughs> yeah. Um, you're welcome. I just have a quick comment. Comment. Uh, in just a minute, we're going to get you a mic here. Surely. There. Thank you so much. Um, you mentioned about um, uh, counselors cannot quote the scriptures. A day is coming, and it's quicker than we think. Um, let me back up a little bit. There are three states in this country that have the most concentration of Muslims. California, New York. Michigan. And no, and the Texas. More yes. Than, more, than, more than Detroit? Well, I'm talking not about the city, I'm talking about the, uh, the state. state. I think the education departments of the government will have to, of the states, will have to contend with this growing number of people who are going to have leverage into saying, hey, you're not going to be doing this anymore. Perhaps that's going to give the Adventists a little help. Uh, the help might come from places that we can never think and dream about. You have a very good point. We tend to be parochial. We tend to think first of inside of our church and then we maybe think inside of, of, of our society in general, but mostly you know, either Christian or atheist. And there's a whole lot else that's going on that we're not paying much attention to. And places not only where we have to worry about what could happen, but also places where we could find allies. Yes, um, 28 um, truths that we Adventists, uh, fundamental beliefs. Do you realize that Islam shares 20 of them? Whereas uh, fundamentalist uh, Protestants share only 13? Hello, who is closer to us? <laughs> Well, uh, some of them are more fundamental than others, shall we say. <laughs> but I agree with you. I agree with you that, uh, that, we, that uh, there are allies that we have not thought of. We, we need to approach everybody, I think, with the idea of what do we share in common instead of what are right, our differences. Right, right. That's what the can point. we fight about? should take uh, most of the time second place to what, well, what can we build you see, upon. You see, radical, you're talking about radical Islam. Okay, fine. But you see, Shias and Sunnis are fighting. They've been fighting all along. They're killing each other more than anyone else. You see, so um, if you took, say, 10% are radicals. So that's where you have to deal with 170 million of them. You see, it uh -huh. gives a bad rap. However, there are many others who when they find out that 
you are a seventh day Adventist, they're going to say, you are my brother. I'm called a mullah by Muslims, <laughs> of all things. They said, no, you're closer to the truth than I am. You see, so you know, maybe this is going to be a blessing that there's a growing population in this country that says, no, this nonsense cannot happen. Let's also look at the practicality of one factor. If we do this right, it's going to make money. So let's, if we don't have any other motivation, let's do it for the money. <laughs> With that, come back next week and we'll uh, start wrapping up.